Through many lives I've drunk the cup of laughter No man could tell the pleasures I've known The star is in the endless sky If one could count would come to billions Yet as vast as are their numbers So many years I wandered far from you Yet as vast as are their numbers So many years I wandered far from you Through many lives I've drunk the cup of sorrow No man could tell the bitter tears I've shed The drops in the endless sea If one could count would come to billions Yet as vast as are their numbers So many years I wandered far from you Yet as vast as are their numbers So many years I wandered far from you Through countless lives I've sought your cup of sweetness Found other cups but thirsted evermore The streams in the hills of time All found their way into a desert Every noon of bright fulfillment Ere many hours did sink to evening gloom Every noon of bright fulfillment Ere many hours did sink to evening gloom I long for you in summer and in winter Only for you My heart this day and night I've known that the sweetest songs Ears ever heard Were but your echo Lord, at last fill me completely For nevermore I'd wander far from you Lord, at last fill me completely For nevermore I'd wander far from you. This week's reading is entitled, In Surrender Lies Victory, Attuning Human Will to God's Infinite Will. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. The following is from the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. It, cha- it, it describes the signs of true strength. We find in all cases that these are the fruit of a life wholly surrendered to God. Humbleness, truthfulness, 
and harmlessness, patience and honor, reverence for the wise, purity, constancy, control of self, contempt for sense delights, self-sacrifice, perception of the certainty of ill in birth, old age, and frail mortality, disease, the ego's suffering, and sin, detachment, lightly holding thoughts of home, children, and wife, those ties which bind most men, and an ever tranquil heart, heedless of good or averse, adverse fortune, with the will upraised to worship me alone, unceasingly, loving deep solitude and shunning noise of foolish crowds, calm focus on the self, perceived within and in infinity. These qualities reveal true wisdom, Prince. All that is otherwise is ignorance. And this is a passage from the Bible, from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And he went a little farther and fell on his face, this is speaking of Jesus, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. This is the commentary. This memorable scene occurs in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night Jesus was betrayed. Jesus' firm will to accept the will of God, regardless of the consequences to himself, is an inspiring lesson for us all. The strength revealed by his obedience stands in poignant contrast to the lack of it in his disciples. The Master condoned their weakness out of compassion for them. How, indeed, could he have scolded them on this night of all nights except lovingly? At the same time, he was showing by his example what determination one must develop to be worthy of knowing God. Success on the spiritual path is not for the merely well-meaning. The road to hell, it is said, is paved with good intentions. Willpower, never wishful thinking, is essential to success in any field, for will generates energy, and energy is what it takes to move mountains, whether with machinery or with the power of faith. The greater the will, Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, the greater the flow of energy. Willpower is a spiritual quality, essentially. Even worldly people with strong willpower often have the potential for great spiritual development. In normal everyday life, the will manifests itself less overwhelmingly as willingness. Willingness was, above all, what Jesus demanded of his disciples. His very teaching said yes to life, especially to a life lived in God. The magnetism of his presence was a constant affirmation of the rightness of living for God. Willingness on the spiritual path means to say yes to God's will. By this attitude, one attunes himself ever more deeply to God's consciousness, thereby attracting unceasing blessings and joy. It must be admitted, however, that the Lord tests his devotees. How else, indeed, could we perfect our willingness? Often it seems as though, out of all possible choices, only that one indicated by God's will for us is sure to lead to disaster. In the end, the opposite invariably proves true. It is the other avenues, if taken, that lead to disaster. 
God's will leads infallibly not only to success, but to that fulfillment which we ourselves craved. His tests, sometimes administered, one can't help suspecting, with a touch of heavenly humor, make our faith in him eventually unshakable. Because Jesus knew of his impending death, one might assume that his anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane was a natural reaction to the approach of physical suffering. Yet he never showed himself attached to the body. The pains of his heart must have had a deeper cause. His sorrow, like his soul consciousness, was universal, not personal. Weighing on his heart can only have been the remembrance of man's eternal rejection of God's love. If at such an hour as that at at Gethsemane, Jesus could show compassion for others, as he did for his sleeping disciples, how much ought we to forget ourselves and be compassionate of others in the trivial hurts of our lives? And if, even at such an hour, he could show perfect willingness to accept God's will, how ready and willing ought we ourselves to be when we face the relatively petty trials of our own lives? Habitual unwillingness is a common human condition, suggesting to the mind endless mountain ranges of problems in the discharge of the simplest duty. For just as willingness draws a constantly fresh supply of energy to the body, so also does unwillingness block that supply. The greater the will, the greater the flow of energy. The corollary of that axiom is, the greater the unwillingness, the feebler the flow of energy. We've all met people of such deep-seated unwillingness that, when merely answering the doorbell, they heave themselves, groaning and sighing to their feet, as if certain they were off to meet their martyrdom. The greater the flow of energy to the brain, also, as a result of habitually willing oneself to think deeply or creatively, the greater one's mental capacity. This is indeed the simple secret of genius, an abundance of mental energy. The weaker the energy flow of the brain, to the brain, on the other hand, the duller a person's awareness becomes. And this is the simple secret of stupidity. Neither stupidity nor genius, however, can be achieved quickly. It takes time for energy to open up new channels in the brain, or for a lack thereof to close existing channels. Here are a few simple rules for developing willpower. Never allow yourself to dwell on the no-saying principle. Learn always to say yes to life. Look always for solutions instead of concentrating too much on your problems. Look for goodness in people. Don't concentrate on their faults. Train yourself to face life's challenges vigorously, always affirming, I can, even when your mental habits cry out in protest, don't be ridiculous, how can you possibly? Set yourself specific tasks to accomplish, small ones at first, then increasingly challenging ones. Be sure to see each one through to completion. Here is a technique that can help you to develop all-conquering willpower. Concentrate at the point between the eyebrows, and around that point, revolve the thought of increasing, of increasingly powerful willpower. Then affirm with ever greater conviction and magnetism, My will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. When Jesus said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, he was referring to his disciples' spiritual debility in identifying themselves with their bodies. But he was also showing by his own example how all weakness can be overcome, never by accepting it, but by deepening one's attunement with the divine will. An attitude of willingness is the first and forever essential step in attuning our will to God's infinite will. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. 
everyone. So nice to see you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I was so amazed at how beautifully written today's um, words were from Swamiji. It's, it's like a treasure, what, what is written in, in today, and, um, and full of so much joy uh, inside of it. You know, he, we start off with the Bhagavad Gita defining a beautiful, strong, spiritual soul with uh, amazing qualities. And Swamiji <coughs> says, okay, be this way, and you can attune to God and follow his will. And then we say, we're not there yet. We're not sure if we can do that. And then he says, okay. You know, then uh, you can meditate. You can, uh, over time, gain these qualities. Over time, learn to uh, tune in very deeply to the presence of God and tune in very deeply to his will. And then people say, well, but I just don't meditate that deeply yet. I just don't see how I'm going to get there. And then he says, OK, then develop willingness. It's the whole key to everything. What, what does Master say continuously? Willpower, will, willingness, willpower, will, willingness, energization exercises, develop willpower, develop willingness, willingness to do energization exercises, <laughs> develop more willpower and more willingness. So all of this talk of willingness, it's uh, it's so, such a simple principle, and yet very often we feel confused. How do I be willing? How am I more willing? There's a very simple exercise we can do around decisions and whether we are actually willing or not in a certain circumstance. Because Swamiji is saying a circumstance comes up and we say yes to life. So how do we know if we're doing that? How do we know? Am I saying yes to life or not? <laughs> and so one simple thing is if you can feel your heart, and when a situation has come up, and you make a decision, and you feel your heart has contracted, that is unwillingness. That is the contracted way towards life. If you feel your heart is open and relaxed, then that is willingness. Then that can lead to following God's will. We don't always know what God's will is. That's a very common question. How do I know God's will? But the first step is willingness. And Willingness naturally leads to being able to hear God's will, feel God's will, and then follow God's will. So I wanted to start off with rereading these. Um, here, let me pull this up too. I wanted to start off with reading these characteristics. So you read these characteristics, you hear these characteristics, you think, oh, I'm not there. I wish I were more humble. I wish I were more this. I wish I were more that. But the truth is, if we meditate, these are the fruits of meditation. So it's not so much as one by one I have to conquer this positive attitude, I have to conquer this po uh, positive characteristic in myself. Instead, if we meditate, if we give our love 
to God, if we are willing, then these qualities are the fruits. They are the, the things that will come to us. Yes, we need to practice them also, but suppose we say, I will no longer be reactive. And then every time we're reactive, we're like, oh, I was reactive again. A meditator is not reactive. A spiritual person is not reactive. And so then we just become smaller and smaller and more and more contracted because we're just so unhappy about having been reactive. Why not work on one kind of situation where you tend to be reactive, where you think, maybe I can learn to not be reactive in this situation. For instance, the auntie who comes over and starts criticizing your life. Make a thought that, you know, when this one person comes, I'm not going to be reactive. And just work on that. And the ability to work on non-reactivity on one thing can open up the doors to be less reactive in many things. Because every time we learn to be unreactive, even though meditation naturally brings non-reactivity, but every time we don't react, every time we give ourselves that extra moment to not speak up something that we will regret, every moment, every time we do that, then it's easier the next time. And, and through that ease, it was a willingness to not say that thing out loud. This willingness to allow God's grace to enter that situation instead and carry us beyond the smallness of things one thing that can help us is compassion for others. Why is that person so unhappy that they have to come and just be so outwardly identified and attached to how I am? Maybe they have some, <laughs> maybe they have some pain in their life. Maybe something went wrong in their life. Maybe I need to have compassion for that person. Doesn't mean I have to be in their presence for very long. <laughs> we don't have to be in jail with people who are negative towards us. But to just take that moment to be less reactive in that moment. So then we're not, I will from now on not be reactive to anything, to I'm going to try not to be reactive in this one situation. That's how what Master said, choose the battles that can be won. So if we choose that battle, Okay, in this situation. Then what also comes from that is a feeling of, I did it. I can do it. I can say yes to life. I can. And this whole I can is such an uplifted thing to feel in life. And the I can't is the no saying principle, the say no to life. We don't want to be in the say no to life. We want to be in the say yes to life. This willingness is such a spiritual principle. It's a deep spiritual principle. And um, OK, so I'll, I'll read these characteristics. Humbleness, truthfulness, and harmlessness, patience and honor, Reverence for the wise. Notice it didn't just say reverence for someone who's older and unwise. It said reverence for the wise. Of course, we're naturally reverent to older people, but it's, Krishna didn't list that. <laughs> <laughs> Purity. <laughs> Constancy. Control of self. Contempt for sense delights. Self-sacrifice. Perception of the certainty of ill in birth, old age, and frail mortality. Disease. The ego suffering and sin. Detachment. 
lightly, hold, lightly holding thoughts of home, children, and wife, or husband, I would add, <laughs> but I'm not going to change Krishna's words, those ties which bind most men, an ever tranquil heart, heedless of good or adverse fortune, so heedless of good fortune or adverse fortune, with the will upraised to worship me alone, unceasingly. See, that's the key. With the will upraised to worship me alone, unceasingly, loving deep solitude and shunning noise of foolish crowds. Hmm, <laughs> foolish crowds. <laughs> We've been noting that it must be a family reunion next door. Our quiet little living room now has become part of the party. <laughs> With multiple babies screaming at any moment of the day, <laughs> I've now put my earplugs in when, <laughs> when we're in the living room. <laughs> so, thus shunning the noise of, I'm not going to call them foolish, but of a crowd. <laughs> Calm focus on the self perceived within and in infinity. These qualities reveal true wisdom, Prince. All that is otherwise is ignorance. So it reveals wisdom. Wisdom is not something, OK, today I'm going to work on my wisdom. That's one of the qualities I want to have, and so I'm going to work on it. Wisdom is a fruit of our actions. Wisdom is a fruit of meditation. Wisdom comes over time. It also comes by making wise choices in one's life and following the little voice that comes into our head. No matter what it says, that's God's will. We know so many times we avoid that, that voice and it led us down the wrong path. So we listen to that voice. So Swamiji, writes, willingness on the spiritual path means to say yes to God's will. By this attitude, one attunes himself ever more deeply to God's consciousness, thereby attracting unceasing blessings and joy. You would think our knowledge, intellectual knowledge, that if I'm attuned to God's will, and if I tune into his presence, I will have unceasing joy and blessings. You would think that would motivate us enough <laughs> to meditate. <laughs> but instead, we get all these little blocks inside. And it's that simple. If we do these things, this unceasing joy, it is a fact. This unceasing joy, this bliss, it is a fact. It is there. It comes through meditation. It's there. But we don't want that all the time. <laughs> Instead, we want other things. And we don't necessarily realize that those other things block the unceasing joy that is there for us to have. Because our desires and our likes and our dislikes block our ability to tune into God's presence. And so meditation naturally works on our likes and dislikes, naturally. The natural outcome and fruit of meditating and, and having deep devotion is letting go of our likes and dislikes. It's not something we have to fully work on. We do have to work on it. We can make choices. But it's much easier to go about it from an indirect way. And that indirect way is meditation. Very often, I don't want it, I won't want it, I'm not gonna have that, makes us want it even more. You know, I refuse to think about that. And then that's all we can think about until we finally get it. So instead, the indirect way is, I'm gonna focus on this other thing instead. I'm gonna focus on Hang Sa, I'm gonna focus on Kriya, I'm gonna focus on this instead, I'm going to energize. And when I focus on these things, then suddenly all these other things happen 
that I didn't have to work at. It just naturally happens. It's so, such a beautiful outcome of meditation. And so when I read this list of things, what comes to mind? Oh gosh, I could never get there. Why even read this? When um, we've taught classes on the Bhagavad Gita, people will often say, I gave up reading that long ago because there's just no way I can live up to that anyway. And so, you know, why even read it and make myself feel badly <laughs> by reading all that? People don't actually live by that, do they? But in actuality, we can. <laughs> These qualities come to us. These are um, attainable by just normal human beings. <laughs> These are attainable by, we're all normal, just normal human beings. We're not, you know, floating up in the astral world, semi-avatars. Maybe I'm half-avatar and I just don't know it. No. <laughs> <laughs> But, Master said, strive to be a Jivan Mukta. If you have Kriya, you can strive to be a Jivan Mukta. The no saying principle, the unwillingness says, no, that's not possible. But if we can open up the mountaintop for ourselves, if we can open up that as a possibility, as a why not? If we can open that up as a possibility, it opens up a lot of willingness below it. It's as though, what is the core of our unwillingness? Sadness, sorrow. What is the cure to sadness and sorrow? Feeling God's presence. Feeling deep love in our hearts for him. That's the cure. And so, if we think, I'll never get there, that causes sorrow. That causes spiritual sickness. Why even try? It's too difficult. That causes sorrow. Deep within, sorrow we're unaware of. And this leads to the life of Christ, which we often focus on Christ's life during the major Christ holidays, Christmas, Easter, and in India, especially, where people are not raised with uh, the life of Christ, I'm not even going to call it Christianity, because Yoganandaji called that churchianity. <laughs> and so that life, what Yogananda taught, we have to let go of all preconceptions we have already of Christ, especially if we're newer and we're walking in the door and saying, why are you talking about that guy? It's we have to let go of all those preconceptions because Yogananda interpreted his life as he was an avatar, he was a guru, just like all the other avatars and gurus on our altar. So letting go all of pre preconceptions. He may be someone's specific guru more than other gurus. That's, that's how he was. He was a guru back then. He had disciples. And what um, Swamiji is explaining in this passage is very, very interesting. So, suppose we are disciples of a great guru that is in the body, and we have seen him perform miracle after miracle after miracle. It's very easy in the presence of someone like that to think, I'm taken care of. Everything's going to be fine. No surprises in life are going to happen. <laughs> and so at this dinner he has called the Last Supper, which is right before this passage, he tells all of his disciples, someone's going to be, one of you is going to betray me. And basically, some bad things are going to go down soon. One of you is going to betray me, and another one, Peter, a guy who's a very, you know, lead disciple in the group, you're going to deny me 
three times before the morning. And you would think, imagine yourself being in the presence of this, your own powerful guru. Make it personal. Your own powerful guru has said that. We, would, we think, well, I'm going to meditate on that. I'm going to think about that. I'm going to meditate on that. We would hope. But even his great disciples, who were no spiritual slouches, they weren't. Master said that Christ practiced Kriya Yoga and taught Kriya Yoga to his disciples. These were Kriya Yogis like us. And they fell asleep while he went and meditated or while he went and prayed in a garden. He just, after the dinner, after kind of applying 220 volts to everybody, this is going to happen. They're all like, I'm full. (laughs) The only way this can happen is because he told you that, and it doesn't make sense. It's like, wait a minute. He has so much spiritual power. Why would, how would all of those things actually happen? How could anything bad happen? He's kind of saying something bad might happen, but does he really mean it? And you know, he has so many powers of miracles and things like that. Couldn't he like make it not happen? In fact, Master said that the Judas, who's the one who betrayed him and got him arrested, that Um, morning, that evening, right, because the next day he dies, he's betrayed, and so Master said that Judas thought, well, if Christ would only show his powers to everybody, then they would finally believe all the things he's saying, rather than having all these split factions of Um, the established current religion of Judaism in that group, all those priests and all those people in charge did not like Christ coming in and imposing on their turf. And so Judas was thinking, well, if I could just show, or Christ could just show his true self to everybody, then they would finally believe and quit harassing us and you know, looking at us as different from everybody else, and I wouldn't feel embarrassed following this guy who says strange things to everybody. You know, he, he kind of had, he was cursed with a material consciousness that made him feel this need to, well, if I just expose him through getting arrested, although there was some money exchange there too, so little attachment to money, Master said. Then he'll show his powers and everything will be okay. Little did he know, Christ says, I'm actually going to fulfill the scriptures, which predict all of this happening, to show people that I am the Christ that comes at this time and does this. And so then, uh, uh, so then I'm going to surrender. And I'm going to just allow them to take me. But first he prays in a garden after telling his disciples this is going to happen. He prays in the garden knowing what's going to happen already. He already told them some things that hinted at it. But he's an avatar. He knows what's going to happen. And so he says... Lord, let this cup pass from me, and nevertheless thy will be done. Meaning, if this isn't something I really have to do, then let's just skip this for now. And then he says, but whatever is your will, let that be done. And so what he is showing is supreme willingness. Supreme willingness to follow. He asked for guidance, and he got the answer. He felt in his heart, thy will be done. He knew it. He knew it anyway. 
a lot of what Master said about the story of these gurus, the stories of these great avatars, including Krishna, is a lot of these stories are written for the common person <laughs> and probably not really what the avatar was actually thinking. <laughs> Meaning, Christ was not suffering. Uh, you know, they call that time when he went and meditated, prayed in the garden, the agony of Christ. He was not in agony. He was in bliss. And he was fulfilling what needed to be done to show people. So, so Swamiji brings up this life of Christ to show us, look, here's an avatar. Here's a man also who supremely could follow the will of God. And then he comes back from praying and sees that his disciples are sleeping. And he has the big picture. He knows I'm, you know, some really bad things are about to happen. And so I'm not going to chastise them and make them feel badly about themselves. I'm going to say, now use your willpower and stay awake. And they didn't because they fell back asleep. And so, so he's first showing he's this great avatar with willpower and the willpower to follow God's will in what's about to happen, including his death. And yet, despite all that drama, he has enough compassion for others to say, come on, don't fall asleep. Come on, come on, wake up. And, and yet... I, I've seen Swamiji do this too, where he just was kind in a situation where you thought he could have been stronger and more, not unkind, but stronger and more, you know, Christ didn't say, I'm about to die, wake up. <laughs> he didn't say that. He just was like, come on, wake up. He was still giving them a teaching. He just wasn't doing it with a hammer. Swamiji did this a lot. Uh, <laughs> and I can still, you know, I still think of my life with him and different episodes come up uh, where I'm trying to think of what did he actually mean of that. And there's quite a few things that are still mysterious that I hope are revealed someday. You know, I think the more I meditate on it, the more hopefully things will be revealed. But um, this is what happens when we're with the guru. And we even receive, the guru doesn't have to be in the body, as we all know. And we hear his guidance. And so I wanted us to do a couple things together. It's on my thing. So just to wrap it up, first let me read the rules that Swamiji wrote. And again, he said, these are rules. He didn't say, here's a few guidelines, just try it. He said, here's some rules to go by to develop willingness so that you can feel the presence of God and feel his unceasing blessings and joy. That's not a theoretical thing. <laughs> it's a real thing. One, never allow yourself to dwell on the no saying principle. Learn always to say yes to life. So feel whether your heart feels contracted or expanded. Look always for solutions instead of concentrating too much on your problems. Focusing on solutions will bypass the problems, which are like banging our head. Well, yeah, OK. It's very easy to only see the problems in a situation. And we think very often the way to solve a problem is to look at the problem and resolve the problem. But this is a very important principle that Yoganandaji taught. Solution consciousness is when you think 
not in terms of the problems, but in terms of the solutions. That sounds obvious, but the way we approach problems is usually not this way. And so we can list solutions, and what solutions does is similar to how meditation allows us to approach um, our faults and desires and likes and dislikes in an indirect way, finding solutions also solves problems in an indirect way, even though it, it's very direct. But rather than banging our heads against the wall on something disturbing or a problem, we instead just go around the problem with the solution and rather than necessarily addressing the problem head on. Swamiji also says that when we encounter something that is so difficult to solve or seems unresolvable, don't put your energy in that direction anymore. It will only diminish your energy. Instead, put your energy in a direction of something you can do, even if it's small, because it opens up the ability to, um, to have energy flow, that the say yes to life causes energy to flow, say no to life, contract. Okay. Look for goodness in people, don't concentrate on their faults. So this is something that is done all the time. Uh, I remember once Starmarajan and I, a long time ago, we were guests at a place with other spiritual people, and it was very nice. And then someone came who was not a meditator and very focused outward on people and things. So you've got this people who are in their spine and uh, kind of relating to others from their spine, and then this other person who's only focused on other people. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? It was such an unpleasant way to <laughs> have to to be around a, a person. And we, in fact, could feel them psychically, constantly checking in on people. Um, the, we often do this. And really, all we need to do is focus on ourself, the, the issue at hand, our own behavior, our own reactions. And it takes care of everything outside of ourselves, rather than focus on controlling others so that we can feel better. This is a, it's a very common habit that happens. Four, train yourself to face life's challenges vigorously. Always affirm I can, even when your mental habits cry out in protest. Don't be ridiculous. How can you possibly? Number five, set yourself specific tasks to accomplish, small ones at first, then increasingly challenging ones. Be sure to see each one through to completion. So we'll put these on WhatsApp for everybody because it, it'd be really something nice to put in your journal and, and kind of start, give yourself the challenge of following it for a month or something like that. So let's end with this affirmation that Swamiji gave us. It's number six. Uh, Swamiji says, here's a technique that can help you develop all conquering willpower. So let's all close our eyes and sit up straight. Concentrate at the point between the eyebrows and around that point revolve the thought of increasing willpower, powerful willpower. Then affirm with ever greater conviction and magnetism. And I'll read it through once and then let's say it together. The affirmation is, my will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. So let's first say it with high energy, OK? You can repeat after me. My will is one with thy will. My will is one with thy will. United to thine. United to thine. My will can move mountains. My will, can move mountains. My will is one with thy will. United to thine, United to thine. My, will my will can move mountains. One more time with full energy. My will is one with thy will. Will, with thy will. United to thine, United to thine. My, will my will can move mountains. 
Amen. Now a little more quietly, my will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. My will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. And more quietly, in a whisper, my will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. My will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. And now quietly, my will is one with thy will. United to thine, my will can move mountains. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. <laughs>